Our next information item is the fall 2018 legislative and school finance update. Um, this always makes me happy. <laughs> It's good to know where we are, but it's just frustrating how our state funds public education. Anyway, Dr. Swift, do you want to introduce this item? Thank you, Madam President and trustees. We have the great opportunity to be at the state uh, superintendent's meeting uh, the end of last week. And I wanted to share with the trustees just uh, a few thoughts. We have, as you can see, Ms. Helton has acknowledged this is Peter Spadafore Association Associate Executive Director of Government Relations for Michigan Association of Superintendents. And I'm going to just share, trustees, a few items that I think are of interest to you all. And then Mr. Dimitro has some eye-opening financial information, uh, which you're right, trustee. I'm not sure. Uh, it will certainly grab your attention. We'll say it that way. Um, I wanted to share right off the bat, trustees, the results of the August election with schools, and this is good news. 96% of the millage requests were passed in the state. That included nine of 11 school bonds and 14 of 18 sinking funds, as well as 86 of 90 public safety tax increases. So across the state, we uh, are understanding that there was strong support uh, for infrastructure renewal for uh, schools and communities. On the right-hand side, it's important to note that 88% were actual increases over renewals, and uh, those were passed, including road uh, senior services and park and rec. So uh, trustees, you as trustees of the Board of Education don't ever hardly get good news from the state level. So I just wanted you to see that uh, communities across the state are stepping up um, and we could talk for a long time about why locals are having to do it. Uh, because it's not occurring at the state and federal level, but I'll, I'll spare you that discussion uh, for a moment. Mr. Dimitri is going to carry the water on that. Uh, we are now just 41 days from our general election on November 6th, um, as we all well know. And I just wanted to share with you Mr. Spadafore's uh, overview, because we realize how significant November 6th of 2018 will be 49% of our statewide executive and legislative offices are open, 71% of Senate, and 39% of House. And of course, we all know 100% of our statewide executive offices, four of four, are open for election. So it's, uh, it's a serious time as we make decisions. I also wanted to point out, not many people think about the State Board of Education. So I felt like trustees, this was worthy of noting this evening that two of our eight state board members, uh, these two happen to be both GOP members, uh, are up for election. Uh, one sitting member, Eileen Weiser, who lives in Ann Arbor um, and is a partner in the Ann Arbor Public Schools, uh, will not be returning. These positions are for eight year terms and worthy of note trustees, as you all know well, because locally we are the bottom of the uh, ballot. Uh, with no straight party voting, folks will have to specifically go to the State Board of Education and make the selection. And party is not noted on those positions, so voters would be cautioned to do their research as you should do anyway ahead of your visit in uh, to the voting booth. If you wanted to know more, we, we were uh, excited to share that Wednesday, October 17th, uh, will be a State Board of Education candidate forum that is posted on the MASA website. Um, trustees, as a side note, um, I was privileged 
to meet the interim state superintendent, Sheila Ailes, um, over this past uh, few days. And I want to share with you how very impressed I was with her message. And her message was a very clear one that reminded me of the importance of leadership for a particular time and place, because her entire focus is on bridging the distance between a state superintendent Wiston's passing and the appointment of a new state superintendent next spring. Um, and that is being delayed uh, because of the election. And she talked about her eight C's, and I will send you more in a note that I have planned for you. But her first C was about continuity and ensuring that the work in support of students, the one and a half million students in the state of Michigan does not skip a beat. And I will also share with you trustees, she was very transparent and open about the shortcomings of MDE in serving the local districts and her focus on improving service to the district. So I, I know that she's only in the job for about eight more months, but uh, trustees, I was encouraged to hear a voice of leadership um, in the state superintendent role. So with that, that is my small opening. Uh, Mr. Dimitro is going to take us through the deterioration and erosion of school aid. Um, I think this is important. Trustees, you've heard me say it before, but when our uh, mantra in Michigan is to be a top 10 state in 10 years, and yet our funding level uh, by nonpartisan uh, national um, assessments, our funding level is at 34th in the country. I am always uh, reminded that we can't legitimately say we'll be top 10 in 10 and fund at 34th. And so our work, both within the district and beyond the district, is to remind everyone uh, that our children deserve the very best that we have to offer, and we are failing them in the way that we have funded uh, schools uh, in Michigan. Two decades ago, Michigan uh, hung out in terms of educational outcomes with the top five states in the country, including Maryland, Massachusetts, Virginia, and states like that. Uh, now we are far below that level in our achievement outcomes in the state. So we have work to do in trustees. I know the first step of getting that work done is to ensure that we're well educated. There is no uh, better person to help us to understand what has really happened with Michigan school funding uh, than Mr. Marios Dimitrou. So I'm pleased to introduce him this evening and just buckle your seatbelts because some of this is quite shocking. Mr. Dimitrou. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Swift. Um, and we'll start with the, the first item. We're going to attack pretty much three items, three big items. Um, and the first one is the diversion of school aid fund, which is supposed to fund K-12 to colleges and universities. And, um, and this started in, uh, in, in 2010, and it started out as a loan. So um, the governor at the time, uh, the, the state was having uh, financial troubles, so they decided to um, take $200 million as a temporary measure and, and then pay it back to the school aid fund. Um, and that, um, that $200 million today is uh, $4.5 billion because it has continued to increase. And, um, and there you see it, $4,549,768,700. So just to um, make it more an arbor-like, so in the state, there's 1,486,000 students. In, if you divide that number statewide, uh, 
it equates to about $3,060 per student. So then when you take that number times the number of students that are in Ann Arbor public schools, which is our last number was 17,698 last year's. We don't have this year's count yet. So if you times that 3,000 times 17,698, you'll come up with a number of 54,160,000, give or take. So um, during this period, we have missed $54 million just because of this phenomenon. So when, when we, we previously talked about divestment in the K-12 education, uh, this is a big part of it, but it's not the biggest part of it, and we'll keep going. So uh, here you, you see a graph um, that shows that community um, colleges, which is a green bar, is funded from the state at 100%. All the funds that the state gives community colleges comes out of the K-12, the school aid fund. Um, and then also you'll see uh, a big jump this year from 15% to 30, approximately 34%. So one third of the money that universities get, public universities get from the state, actually comes from the money that was for K-12. That is for K-12. Um, now, this graph is another, um, a second diversion that has been happening. And um, it, it is, the, there are, uh, it, the biggest one is this one over here the blue line. And just to explain that one is when Proposal A passed, uh, we, we all you know, voted for it to, to change the funding to go to the state with the assumption and the promise that the state would keep its effort the same, that uh, we will pass the two extra percent on, on sales tax and, but you can see that the state was contributing 650, and this is the general fund, general fund, general purpose. The, 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 the state has two funds, the school aid fund, and then the general fund, general appropriation fund. So the general fund was actually contributing $650 million to the school aid fund. So immediately after proposal A passed, they started diminishing, the state started diminishing their effort. So if you take the amount of money to make up the 650 every year, and you go to the present year, it's about, in my calculations, based on the graph, about $10 billion, $10 billion a little bit over $10 billion. So again, if you divide that by the number of students in the state, that's $6,810 per student. And if you times that based on the number of students that we have in our school district, which is 17,698, you come up with a $120,527,525 just because of this blue line here. If the state kept their effort the same, we would have had in our system since 94, 95, another 120 more. $20 million. I have, we're not done yet. Oh. <laughs> so, um, just to answer your question, between the two, we're 174 million. Mm -hmm. But we still have one more thing to go through. So, <clears throat> what is shown here is items that the general fund paid for in the past, and now they are paid for by the, they shifted it over to the K-12. And these items are like the school bond redemption fund and cash flow borrowing cost and juvenile detention facility. And uh, so you see the list over here all kinds of things that the general fund, general purpose used to pay for, 
and now the um, the school aid fund pays for. So now if you add the numbers here, you'll come up with a one billion eight hundred and ninety nine thousand and, and a million, I'm sorry. So again, if you do the calculations, the impact on an Arab public schools is twenty two point six million dollars. So overall, these three items equal one hundred and ninety seven million dollars. I'm not sure about you, but that's that's a lot of money, and we can do a lot of good things for kids with that money. So these are all the items that the state general fund, general purpose fund, used to pay for, but now it is paid out of the K-12 fund. So where did this money go to? That is the next question. So... Um, the biggest part of it went for a tax cut to corporations. Um, so every year since 2011, I think it was in the first six months of the current administrations that they passed this law. And uh, so um, the Michigan business tax was eliminated and it was replaced by um, it's replaced by the corporate tax, which is about a billion and a half less than, so uh, all the money that was coming in from the Michigan business tax that was eliminated to the school aid fund, that was gone. Um, also, um, pensions for retirees started to be taxed. So that was another item to pay for the tax cut. And then also the earned income credit was eliminated from people of limited income. So students, elderly, and people with limited income paid for a tax cut to go to corporations. It just doesn't seem fair. So um, when Dr. Swift talked about the funding in Michigan, these are a variety of articles that show some of these, the data that we just, uh, we just, we just saw, that how K-12 education has been, um, um, the funding has been eroded. So um, in the past year, there has been uh, a school finance research collaborative, and they, um, they ask the basic question, how much does it take to educate um, students in Michigan? So on the average, regular education, uh, I would say general education, um, in Michigan, that does not include special education or uh, English language learners or uh, students that are at risk or living in poverty um, or um, career technical education and so forth, that it takes 9,590. And even in this number, it does not include transportation, it does not include food service, capital cost, and it only includes pension costs at 4.6% of wages. Just so you know, a pension costs are approximately 37%. So uh, this is a very, very low number. And a foundation, which includes a lot of these things, is below, uh, currently for 1819 is 9,410. And we have to pay 37% on pension, not 4.6. And we have to pay for transportation. Um, in, in addition, it takes additional, should be provided for special education. Uh, all those items that I mentioned earlier, that would be at least 10% of the base cost for each one of those. And then, based on your size, you would need to get, more. the smaller you are, you would qualify for additional funding. 
it is very interesting to see that preschool student, three to four, they estimate that it takes 14,155 to educate. Um, so, and then the transportation, that would be an additional 731. So we will qualify for significant increases if this model was adopted. Um, there is a little video that we would like to show you in regards to this collaborative. So much has changed in the last 25 years. Encyclopedias have given way to Google, rotary phones to the iPhone. 25 years ago, flat screen TVs and self-driving cars seemed like science fiction. Yet today, we still fund Michigan schools the same way we did 25 years ago. Michigan spending per pupil and student performance have dropped dramatically in the last decade. A new approach is needed that prepares all students for college and the 21st century workforce, and one that recognizes all students are unique and have a wide range of learning needs. The School Finance Research Collaborative has completed Michigan's first comprehensive school adequacy study to determine what it truly costs to educate a child. The Collaborative is a diverse bipartisan group of business leaders and education experts, from Metro Detroit to the UP, who agree we must change how Michigan schools are funded. The collaborative study was recently completed by the nation's top two school finance research firms, with input from nearly 300 Michigan educators. The study determined that per-pupil funding should be increased to provide all students with a high-quality education that helps them achieve and succeed. The study found that it costs a minimum $9,590 to educate a child in Michigan, regardless of location, income, learning challenges, or other circumstances. That amount does not include transportation, food service, or capital costs, and only includes pension costs at 4.6% of wages. The report recommends that brick-and-mortar charter schools and traditional public schools should be funded at the same level, and it quantified additional costs for special education, English language learners, and students living in poverty. The report concluded that 10% additional to the base cost should be provided per career and technical education enrolled student. It found it cost $14,155 to educate a preschool student. The report also determined that funding must be adjusted based on district size, with smaller districts receiving increased funding. And the report concluded that districts in geographically isolated areas and student transportation costs should be addressed so that the unique needs of every district or charter school are fully funded. Rather than a cookie-cutter, one-size-fits-all approach to school funding, Michigan's school finance system needs to take a more research-based, individualized approach. Michigan policymakers now have a roadmap to provide adequate and equitable funding for a pre-K-12 education that prepares all students for bright futures. So while Michigan currently ranks at the bottom in student performance, this new study charts a bold course to change that. So much has changed in the last 25 years, and now it's time for the way we fund schools to embrace the future and change as well. To read the study or learn more, visit www.fundmischools.org. So I think that's, that's potentially the opportunity we have as we look to the midterm elections and having a new governor. A new governor will be in office, but hopefully we'll, one, have some actual checks and balances at the state level so that you can't introduce a bill and five minutes expect a vote because it's partisan lines only and the other party doesn't matter. Um, Hopefully, we will start developing a platform and be part of that expert group that gets asked to help think about how do we adequately, not just adequately, but how do we actually position Michigan to be an excellent place that has everything to do with the future of our state. In 2010, the last time we had a census, so we, our next census is 2020, we lost a seat in the House of Representatives because so many people left the state of Michigan. That's the future we're creating with this kind of a funding model. This is the core of the economic future of our state. So if we want to have a different outcome come 2020, we need to create a place where people feel like they can raise their children 
in an excellent public school system. And that's what Amazon looked at when they looked at Michigan and decided not to really think about us too much because number one, we didn't have public transportation. Number two, we didn't have a well-trained workforce. And that's how any business will look at us until we fix this problem. In Ann Arbor, we're fortunate. We have an educated population that values education. But we cannot continue to overcome these kind of numbers alone. It's frustrating to see this. I mean, it's really, truly frustrating to see what years of basically no checks and balances have left us. And it's our children that suffer the most. I'm proud of this district for where we've been able to be and how hard we've had to fight to do that and the hard decisions we've had to make over time. Um, but we are, we are a little beacon in Ann Arbor that's different than the rest of the state. Thank you. Thank you.